All right, y'all, I have the great opportunity to present to you a wonderful topic title. You see that, right? That is a lie. Well, some of you look at me and go, what? The title is Doubting Thomas, right? We have in Scripture, turn with me initially to the end of Mark's Gospel, please. Because we're dealing with the resurrection of our Lord and Savior in all this time together in Shepherd's Haven. But we hit the topic of Doubting Thomas. And let me ask this, how many of you have ever preached on Doubting Thomas? Some of you have and some of you haven't. Okay, interesting. How many of you have ever doubted anything in your life? Okay, we're going to be interactive here because we're not doing this, brothers. We're going to be in trouble in this session, okay? Well, the, the word doubt means to not take for um, truth, right? To, 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 to be discouraged to understand all these different things we have. And as a matter of fact, a number of synonyms that are in uh, the, around the word, ambiguity, apprehension, confusion, difficulty, disbelief, distrust, fear, hesitation, misgiving, a problem, qualm, a uh, re reluctance, a skepticism comes into play. And all those synonyms should be quickly cluing us in in Christendom of our world around us right now. So my desire in our session is to put the rubber where the road meets the road literally in our world today application type message and encouragement for us on this figure we call Doubting Thomas. And let's look at the end of Matthew. Where am I going to find Thomas at the end of Matthew? Well, we have in the Great Commission in the midst, this is going to come in dovetailing well with what we just heard on the scepter's aspect, and we have this Great Commission to do this. Here's our Great Commission, gentlemen, but it starts off in verse 16 saying, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but what? Some doubted. We have that. How many of your translations say doubted? How many have a translation that says some other word besides doubted? Isn't that interesting? Because it's the root, root word we have here for to doubt. Now, it doesn't say Thomas, right? It said some doubted. Now, we know, and where's our, all of our Greek guys? You know, so I'm looking at all of you on purpose. Some of you have been going through the Greek stuff. Tim, you're back there, and others. Okay. Brian, you ready for this one? Okay, he's not paying attention to me. That's all right. Um, no, the word "some." What does it have? This, again, we're going to be interactive. What, what does it have? The idea conveying in the original language. You guys help me out. Excuse me, a portion, but not all. Does it? Is it a singular? Okay, it can be right, but not always. The context is king in our language, and we do our language study. We do our as uh, Brother Allen encouraged us to do our word breakdown and our sentence structure breakdown. It means there may be a possibility that some of them were in doubt. What were they doubting? They had seen, by this point, they had seen the Lord multiple times. They had acted with him, encountered him, and now he's ready to give them this great commission. So at that moment on that hill, why does Matthew, who is very detail-oriented in presenting the king, say some doubted well what they were doubting is an interesting plethora for us to dig into of a lot of things that could have been but we don't have time for it today but we're going to look then he gives this great commission and Jesus came and spake to them all saying all power all authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth go you therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and the son and the holy ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world, or end of the age, amen. This great commission moment given to all of us called to be under shepherds, called to be leaders in churches, all Christians really given this great commission. Where's the doubt then? In the midst of this, let's turn back over to John here and look at the subject figure at hand here, John 20. And we introduce Thomas. Now, we don't have a ton about Thomas. We do know that Thomas at one point when Jesus is being saying, I must go to Jerusalem, I must go to Jerusalem. Some of you already hit on that. We have Thomas then going, 
and the other got the Lord, you know, they wanted to kill you there, you know, and I'm paraphrasing for time's sake, and, and, and Thomas goes, and sometimes we read it, we picture him like this, all right, well, let's go and die with him also, all right? And then sometimes we get this figure, all right, like Peter, all right, let's go die with him. Which one is it? The language gives us some hints there. At the same time, why do we call him Doubting Thomas if he is ready to go to the death with our Lord? What's going on in this disciple's mindset? My brothers, all eyes up here for just a minute, and I'm going to get kind of personal with us. How many of us in ministry have ever doubted saying, Lord, have you really called me here? What am I doing in this place? Why am I here ministering to these people? These stiff-necked, Lord, why? Raise your hand if you've never had that experience before. It's the wrong good company, right? So I'm trying to get to the heart and the demeanor of things because we in our great commission are going to face adversity. If we live godly in Christ Jesus, we're going to suffer some type of persecution. That's his promise. We're going to struggle somewhere along. We're going to fight. This is a battle. It doesn't have the separatist battle that was just presented to us. It's the battle here and here in our service to our Savior. Does that make sense? So when we come to this figure, Thomas, we throw him under the bus and we call him Doubting Thomas, but the, we always turn to, or we hear people turn to, John chapter 20, let's look at this figure, the Doubting Thomas. Now let's do this really fast, and, and for sake of time, let's read through we have the appearance, the Lord is risen, we know this, Mary and, and Magdalene and others come and tell, hey, we've seen the Lord, he is risen, and she's encountered him, and then we come down to verse 19, and it says, then that same day, uh, evening, when the, the first day of the week, when the doors were, sh were shut, the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. Fear. Um, fear. How many of you have got your Greek pulled up right now? curious yeah what, what word for fear is used there in john john chapter 20 verse uh we got there 19 so for fear of the jews this he's john's looking up john chapter 19 here uh or chapter 20 verse 19 um fear when we think of fear what do we think of here's the interactive part again help me we're gonna play sunday school we can do this right guys we do it with our people come on let's do it with each other Phobos, and we get our English word what? Phobia. Now, how many of you know people that you've canceled that have had some type of phobia before? Fear. And it's just not the, oh, I'm, I'm startled, like Brother Mark did to me yesterday morning, and I told him, he said, hey, if my alarm hasn't gone off and you got up in the room, just go ahead and tap the side of the bed, right? It's not that I have some phobia, but he said his life flashed before his eyes because he had fear because when he hit my foot instead of the bed, I came up like this. That's part of my background, my fighting background and stuff. It's like, whoa, hang on, who's, who's messing with me bodily, right? But a phobia has this idea of something that's embedded, that's a learned behavior ingrained to fear, right? So here it is. They now, because of their learned behavior, the experience that they had all went to together, seeing the Lord they're one that they thought was going to enter and set up the kingdom, all of a sudden in their minds, they are fearful because the Jews had done what to them? Their leader. Killed him. Wait, wait, wait. We're accusing the Jews of killing our Lord? In their minds, that's what happened, right? And yet the Romans were the ones that executed him, technically. But time out. We can move to many other pieces of scripture that say we all did it of all age and time. Our sin put him there. But their fear, though, is still of the Jews coming and doing the exact same type of thing to them. Had the Lord not told them a couple, I think it's in scripture somewhere, I think a couple of times, he said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, you're going to take me, and I'm going to die for you. True? He's told them that. So what are they fearful of? They're fearful of the Jews. Can you imagine every time a Roman garrison went down their street where they were hiding, they heard the, the rattle or they heard the, the, 
the temple soldier coming through. And they heard the rattling of their equipment and so forth, or a horse, because not everyone had a horse. You hear the clumping of a horse hoof. They're feared. They're, they're, they're scared. And we got to put it this way. People today that we minister to often have this same type of fear of a lot of things going on. Right now they have fear of our current governmental situation. They have fear of medical situation. They have fears of financial situation. Just recently, right? So let's put the rubber meets the road. Um, Pastor, my brother in Christ, how many of you have had some fears in the last year? So let's not throw these guys under the bus and back it up and hit them again. Let's do what we're supposed to do, encouraging, provoking one another into love and good works. And let's do the, the things God's called us to do in that love chapter. You started getting emotional about praying about. And, and we look at this. We are supposed to love one another in such ways that when they see that if, if we love one another, we prove that we are what, guys? We show that we're his disciples. They were trying in some way to figure this out, and, and it says that the, the doors were locked, as we see here, and he stood in the midst. Here's this resurrected, glorified body passing through the walls, passing the, through the doors. Now, it's interesting that John puts in here uh, that he, he stood in the midst, and, and the doors were shut, it says, and the idea here from originally, we know they were locked. They, they were guarded off. It wasn't going to be just a, hey, I'm walking in the door as Alan's walking in the door right now. No, this was locked off. And he walks in the midst, appears to him, this glorified, risen Savior, and he says, if he said it in the Hebrew, we know it would be Shalom Aleichem. And he wouldn't have just said Shalom like they do in Judaism today. Shalom just means hey or hi or whatever, if you want to put it that there in the current vernacular. But I'm picturing, because it says, peace be unto you, Shalom Aleichem, peace be unto you from God. And he's the one standing before them as God. My peace be unto you, in other words. Why? He knew their heart. I personally believe that he knew their heart, that there was fear involved in the midst of this whole situation. So now we have this peaceful one, that our, our Lord and Savior, the risen Savior, the, the one we're talking about through all this conference here on the road to the resurrection. What does this resurrection body look like? You all have already nailed it in a number of your presentations. And this passes through. There's something different about it. And when he had said so, he shows them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad. They, 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 they saw the Lord. They realized, oh, it's, it's, it's our Lord. Now, wait a minute. They were just in the midst of fear. Well, how did they move from fear to gladness all of a sudden? And the word Greek word, John's looking at the Greek again. There, the word for glad there is which word in the Greek? got it here, but I like to interact, okay? So. He's looking it up. It, 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 we have this word glad that has an influence of not just attitude, but heart comes into this word. You got it yet? Not yet. Okay, anyone else got it? Brian, get yours up. Someone else. What? There we go. Th th this is not just a hey, I'm happy. Right? This is that word that means Oh, yeah, type moment. You know, I've been waiting for Brian, your sons back there, to just inadvertently through one of the sessions just go, yeah, because they're watching sometime, maybe not during the sessions, they're watching the NCAA tournament. <laughs> All right? And have that commercial moment like, oh, oh no, 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 no. So, it, because, oh, yeah, something glad, they, they got joyful, they got glad that something good happened. This is that type of word as we see when we study out that word. We're going to see, oh, yeah, it's, it's our Lord. Now, if you, okay, let's see, we're here, and all of a sudden the Lord just appears in front of me. I'm going to definitely fall on my face before him, but it, it, he does that. Wouldn't we be glad if the Lord goes, here, look, it's me. Y'all. But how many of you would be struck with fear at this moment as this figure just appears in front of you? Whoa, what is going on? This is in the midst of them happening, that's happening. And he says to them again. So because of this, even though he said, said it once, he says it again. Shalom aleichem, peace be unto you. As my father sent me, even so I send you. What is this referring to? What did we read in Matthew? This great commission, I'm going to send you out. I have a purpose for coming back to you here in this also. 
Now we know if we, if we, we're going to study the power of the resurrection tomorrow from my, one of my sessions, but we're going to look at this. And part of that power of the resurrection is that the Lord himself rises again victorious over death, hell, and the grave to give us, say, yes, his death and his burial was one thing, paying for our sins. But God the Father, as we know, as ministers of the word, put the stamp of approval on that sacrifice, saying, I accept it, now I'm risen, now there's something to do. Time to get busy. And this is part of that, I'm going to send you. And and when he had said this, he breathed it on on them and, and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now, you know how many commentators and skeptics want to go into this passage and say, well, what happened at Pentecost then? Right? If he was so powerful as a risen Savior right then, he gave him the Holy Ghost. Why is that? And if you want to get technical on that one, I don't have time for that in my 30 minutes left. Because there's a, a situation that's going on specifically on that one. But he gives them the Holy Ghost, says, Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted of them. And that's another topic in the sermon in itself or teaching in itself in the original language. And sins remit, and they are retained. Now, here we go. You know, some people say that, that Greek language there is reminding us that the sins that are, are forgiven if they have believed. There's faith factor coming into play there because of the language. Now, Thomas. But. Thomas, but Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, which means twin, was not with them when Jesus came. And the other disciples therefore said unto him, and this is the phrase from our original language we get repeatedly, kept reminding them, because of the tenses and nuances used in the original language. I kept saying, hey, we, we, we've seen the Lord, we've seen him, we, we, we keep saying, we have seen the Lord, but, but he said unto them, except... I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side. I will not be, oh, I'm going to, just going to be doubting. Is that what it says? I'm going to have some skepticism. Is that the word that's used? John's looking up ahead of him. He's catching on to me, I think. In the original language, this is not the word for doubt that we find in Matthew. This is pisteo. This is faith. This is the thing we all say we have in him. In other words, this man that says, I'm going to go die for you. I'm going to go, let's go to Jerusalem. I'm going to die with him. Let's go do this. He takes these stands, these little glimpses of this character we don't know that much about as an apostle. He says this, unless I do this, I'm not going to believe. So take that title, rip out doubting. Do we put in unfaithful? Unbelieving Thomas, because of this word that's used, that's recorded by the Apostle John. Is John and the Holy Spirit lying to us? Thomas is having an issue, a battle of what? Just say it, guys. Faith issue. Is this what we have with people that we interact with and deal with? Let's pause on the text for just a moment, and let me read some things to you all. Because it's hard to, in some ways, it's really hard to believe this. But um, surveys, sometimes they're not worth their grain and salt, you know, uh, weight-wise. But let me tell you what's going on in the last 10 years. I looked at 10 years different varying surveys from Europe, Great Britain, and America. In Christendom, I'm going to put quote, man, Christendom. One title, when I first pulled up, said 99% of Christians do not believe in the full bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is in a European nation. In the UK, another survey says this. It claims that over half of UK believers, only half of those that go regularly to church somewhere, at least once a month, believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. In an article from the Christian Post, one article says, one in four British Christians say the resurrection of Jesus did not occur. We come to the Americas. Most Americans believe in the resurrection of Jesus, but polls show they don't believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Are we dealing with a bunch of Gnostics now? It's an honest question, is it not? 44% of Aussies believe in the resurrection of Jesus, and they say they are Bible-believing Christians in the survey. 
44, that means how many, 60, basically only 60% don't believe it. Christianity Today, what do you believe? Probably a heresy about Jesus says a certain survey because there are 59% in this one particular survey from evangelical, particular evangelical circles says they don't believe in the bodily resurrection. One third of teenagers in a survey say that they believe in the resurrection. That means two thirds of them do not. One quarter of Christians do not believe in the resurrection, the bodily resurrection of Jesus. You want to get emotional? What have we been doing then? You want to get where the rubber meets the road? We, we blame doubting Thomas on things, title-wise, but he had a struggle of issue of faith. What is the church, people in Christendom, having a struggle with, gentlemen, according to these surveys and what we're seeing. An issue of faith. Who are we supposed to be as ministers of the word of God? Men of the faith. Let's put the definite article in there. Do we believe, and I'm, I, I'm probably wanted to do this just straight out, how many of us truly believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus the Christ, the Messiah? How often do we preach it? How often do our people get a hold of it? How many, how many of you want to go and do a survey of your own church now after hearing this and say, how many of you truly believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ? Or are they having a faith crisis because the influence of the world around them, the situations of the world around them, just like in Matthew, when it describes they were in fear? Well, if I believe that, I had one college student in our campus ministry one time said, you know, I'm going to call on the Lord to be my Savior now, but do I have to believe in the bodily resurrection? Because that, that's a hard one to fathom. If someone that does not believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus, are they truly a born-again believer? I think some of you kind of covered some of that, didn't y'all? Are they having an issue of faith? Thomas here is having an issue of faith. Now, how many of you like it when the Lord, um, or no, let's put that, how many of you like it when anyone uses your own words against you? Anyone in here not like that? No. Especially as a pastor, right? You say something, and someone comes back and says, Pastor, you said this, and I'm mad about that. Right? And you go, wait a minute, did I really say that? You start questioning your own mind, right? Did I actually say those words? Did it come or did it just come across that way? And you start going back to the exact word, and you use your own exact words back to them to try to defend yourself or set up an opportunity to, to defend yourself, right? Here, here's Thomas. We know the story. The other disciples, they're, 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 they keep telling him this. After eight days again, it says in the text, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. And then came Jesus, the doors being shut, locked up again, and stood in the midst of them and said the same phrase he said before, Shalom Aleichem, peace be unto you. Then he turns to Thomas. Would you have loved to have been Thomas at that moment? I'm having an issue of crisis of faith. I can't believe it unless I see it, feel it, touch it. So I don't think, you know, some people have tried to put Thomas in and say, well, he was a skeptic. He was a doubter. Um, he was this. He was that. Our world today, we might call him he was a realist. That term is being bounced around a lot right now, isn't it, in our, in our culture? He's a realist then. And that's where a lot of people we have, they're real. They have a hard time with faith because they don't, one, hardly see it exhibited. And two, they don't even know what they believe. They haven't been truly discipled. And that's part of our job as pastors to disciple people and make disciples of them. Great commission again, right? Because people have an issue of faith. He's having this issue of faith. And then the Lord looks right at him. And Thomas, and can I put it in our vernacular? And, and, am I going to have any textual critics get a hold of me and rip me over and put me on a post for doing this? All right, big boy, come here, Thomas. Put your fingers here. Put them in my nail prints in my hand. All right, big man, come here. Take your hand and thrust it in my side. 
And the Lord doesn't use the phrase, be not doubting. It's not the word. We've got to rip that title off of this guy. He says this. He says, thrust into my sight and be not what? Without faith. In other words, stop being without faith, right? Don't be faithless, but what? Be in the faith. Be in faith, trusting. When I have people that have an issue of faith that I deal with, I often I take them back here. I said, you're not doubting. You're either in the faith or you're not. You're either trusting the, the, the finished work of Jesus Christ at Calvary's cross, his death, burial, and then the power of his resurrection, or you're not. I said, and you're in good company if you're struggling with that. And they always kind of look at me like, what? Thomas. An apostle had a faith issue? Yes. If the language is exact, and that's what we've been looking at, that's why I wanted you to look at it with me. We have a faith issue involved, and Jesus then calls him out on it. If we went to Mark, we'd see where, that, where Mark just simply kind of records it, that the Lord reviled them for their lack of faith, their lack of trust. These are the apostles, guys. These are the ones that went out and turned the world upside down for our risen Lord and Savior. So let me ask this then. Where's your faith struggling, my brother? In a world that's struggling right now, in the churches that are struggling right now, in bible circles, separatist stands are struggling right now, Where's our issues of faith that we maybe have not dealt with personally today with our Lord? Is this a fair question? Ser seriously, help me. I'm kind of the newbie here. I've only been here a year. You know, you, know, you get to kick me out after this if you don't like it. But, you know, it, I mean, this is, we're, we're, we've got all this great information and technical information, but what are we doing with it? And do we have our own issues of faith that we need to deal with so we can exhibit and show forth the faith to people that need to see it? Jesus uses that own, his own words against him and calls him out on this. Stop being faithless. Let's go back to Peter walking on the water. I mean, can you imagine this moment when Peter jumps out and, and, and he's walking on the water? I mean, if, if it's any of us, well, I'll pick on Brother Mark. If it's Brother Mark back there, Brown, and, and, and he's Peter, you know, and he'd be looking back at, hey, Brother Rich, look, I'm walking on water. Check this out. Do you see that attitude coming out? His brother Alan would be like, I'm keep my eyes on the Lord. I'm, I'm walking on water, guys. Check this out. Lawrence would be like, boom, straight at the Lord. You know, here, here it is. The different personalities of these brothers. But can you imagine Peter's personality as we see? I'm walking on the water. I'm, I'm here. He's got his eyes on the Lord. He's going. And then all of a sudden, he looks at what? Just say it, y'all. The winds and the waves, his circumstances, his situations around him. And he sinks. My brothers, how often do we do that? In the ministry, in pastoring, do we look at our circumstances and people and say, well, that person is just a prickly pear and I'm so sick of messing with them. How many times do we have to go through this? And our faith wavers. Lord, why aren't you dealing with this person? Why are you making me do it? brother is a stalwart in the church and comes in and says, you know, I think I'm going to leave. I'm not getting fed here like I want to be fed. What happens to our faith at that moment when our circumstances, our winds and waves get boisterous around us? Or we have a health issue personally. Or we have a loved one with a health issue and personally and we start questioning the Lord. Now, does it say anything in that encounter with Peter that Peter questioned the Lord? It just says he sunk when he got focused on those things. He took his eyes off the Lord. And the Lord, he cries out, save me. One of you brought it out in the session. Save me. Rescue me, right? And what does the Lord hit him with? Someone say it. He didn't say, when did you start to what? Say it. When did you stop trusting me? Where was your faith? When did you stop having faith, Peter? See, the Lord's continually dealing with these men about faith issues. He deals with us about faith issues also. 
where we stand, how we walk, what we're doing with this great information that we have in God's word, all the way to the technical aspects of the original language, which aids us in conveying this message of faith. And so here we are. Thomas is asked that, stop believing, stop doing this. And what does Thomas answer? I, I, I want you all to help me with this. We, we see it right here. It says, and, and answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. All right, who's willing to help me out? Raise your hand real fast. Raise your hand a little bit nervous. Good. How do you picture this? How do you convey this to someone? When Peter says, my Lord and my God. Complete humility and surrender. Someone else, what does that look like? What does complete humility and surrender look like? Does it not look like adoration? Do you all see that? I know five pastors out of ministry right now. Four of them because they said the ministry is too hard. One of them because he messed up in his personal life. When I talk to all five of them, they've lost faith and adoration. All five of them. Yet they go to church at another church. They go to worship. And when I personally engage with them, they I can tell. You can tell you know how you can tell when someone just has no adoration for the Lord. Thomas had to see it. He was a realist. He had to see it. And when he did, he falls on his knees in, I believe personally, in adoration worship. My Lord and my God. How do I know this? Because early church history tells us that Thomas went where? The next thing we have recorded, we see him in the book of Acts, with him continuing in one accord in prayer, right? And moving forward. But then where do we know he's end up martyred, most likely? India. India. Wait a minute. Didn't someone else want to go that way? And the Lord held him off? Because he had a single purpose in this now faithful adoring man that adored the Lord to go to a people that was adoring idols and he was supposed to show them in faith the one they're supposed to have faith in. And he dies there doing it. But look at verse 30 just for our quick grins and time, giggles time's sake here. Let's look at this. It says this, and many other signs truly did uh, Jesus well, the, in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. You say, but Pastor Rich, you, you brother, you, you skipped some verse, a verse here. Yeah, I did on purpose. John goes in and says, there are so many signs and others that, that, that which are not written. I, in other words, I ran out of time. I, I ran out of space. Book. In, in late, another place it says that, hey, you, you have, it, it, the whole world cannot contain the books we wrote on every detail that this man, Jesus, the Christ, the, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, our God did. Just in his earthly realm moment, his earthly ministry moment. But let's now back up to that verse 29. After Jesus said this, he said, Thomas, because you have seen, and that word seen, you've looked upon, you, you've actually seen it, thou hast believed. We don't have any recording of him actually sticking the fingers in the nail prints, do we? We don't see him physically recorded that he thrust his hand into the side of the scar where the spear went up and showed that our Lord died of a broke first heart. We don't see that, but we see him calling him out on this and saying this, because you've seen, you believe. This is where it gets personal. And people say, well, did Jesus ever talk about future believers? Blessed are those who have what? Not seen and yet have believed. What is he describing right there? Us. He's also describing that word we've been looking at, pisteo, right? Faith. In other words, they haven't seen it. They still have the faith. They're still in the faith. So let's do this. You take your people that's having a faith issue. You bring them right back here and say, let's show you the risen Lord. But also let's show you some disciples that have some uh, issues with faith. Struggling. Is this a practical moment? Is this a reality moment? I mean, you can bring in the Greek if you want to. You can talk about the shalom aleichem and stuff, the peace be unto you. You want peace, and that's what people usually want, right? They want, they're want they having a faith issue, and so in their faith issue, they're looking for some type of peace. And if they get their peace from anything else, it's a, not a lasting peace. We see Thomas getting a lasting peace, I believe. But also, he got 
flopped upside the head with reality, did he not? And this is where we have to be directly, graciously, lovingly direct when we have to. And yet at the same time, lovingly coddling, saying, you're not alone, my brother, my sister, in this faith crisis you're going through. And let me show you this. Why? Because you're talked about in Scripture from our Lord. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet shall believe. And what's the purpose of the book? Jump into it. But these things are written that you might what? It's his big theme, right? Throughout the whole book of John. That you might be in the faith, in other words. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and in believing that you may have life through his name or in his name. Here's a faith issue, a crisis of faith that we handle, and it's not a doubting issue. It's not just mere skepticism. How many of you have ever read uh, Archer's book on skeptics? Anyone done that one before? And you look at that. I did that because I had a lot of skeptics around me in our campus ministry days, from professors to others, and they come and say, you know, I, I, I think I believe, but I have, a, I have a problem with this in Scripture. I have a problem with that in Scripture. This is not a technical message, as you know. We could get there if I wanted to, and but I want us to be very practical. i got to ask this, guys. This is God's word, right? We'll get Vince Lombardi on you. How many know? You remember that? You know, When his Packers had a problem, they were champions for a long time, and then they were having a problem. And he picks up a football and he says, gentlemen, this is a football. And all of them kind of looking like, well, duh, coach, right? If I walked up here at the beginning of the whole thing, after Rich gave me an introduction, and said, gentlemen, this is the word of God, the infallible word of God. And yes, we go through all the technicalities of everything, those things, but do you believe it wholeheartedly? You'd be like, well, duh, yeah, of course I do, brother. I hope you do. Because we went up to people within even Baptist circles. We went up to people within evangelical circles. And we asked them, do you believe everything in this book we call the word of God? I wonder where they would land in the percentages I just gave you of those surveys. Another survey says this about pastors in evangelical circles in the United States of America. When asked about the resurrection and the afterlife and what do we believe, Forty-six percent question. Forty-six percent question the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. I don't know who all they surveyed in this Ramsey one. Another one in the Christian Standard group did the same type of thing. I don't know who the a Gallup poll says. How many Americans truly believe in God? Twelve surveys, different surveys made up that one, just believing in God. And the percentages are so low. So it makes me think, one of you presented, will the faith be found when he comes back? What days are we living in? Days that are lacking what? Pisteos, right? Faith. Why? Is it some of our fault as ministers? Do we exhibit it? Do we live it? Do we exhort one another in it? I think we've been doing that this week so far. But what are we going to do with it when we leave? Pause some questions. Again, not very technical, but I hope it's practical for us to be contemplating all these wonderful things we've been feeding on so far this week. See the sign, guys. See the sign, guys. See the sign. Yep. And so we answer it right there. We, answer. we know the book has all the answers for everything. So you're right, brother. Yeah. Other thoughts on this? How many of you ever realized that Doubting Thomas is not a Doubting Thomas? Okay. Yeah, I've been there, seen it, done it, done the language studies, right, Albert? Yes. But how often do we actually proclaim that truth? I mean, 
what, what a message at Easter to talk about. Oftentimes we skip over Thomas because, man, I don't want to get our people, or, or, or talk to one pastor, says, I don't want to get our people in, into any doubting issues, you know, struggling issues. Are you kidding? What an issue to, to address at Resurrection Sunday, Easter time. Can I ask you all a question? Besides the one I just did, since I got nine minutes, I'm storing up like Brian did for next session, you know. Um, how many of you actually treat Easter Resurrection Sunday as just one Sunday and you move on? Give me a preacher. Don't answer that out loud right now. Now let me ask this. How many of you preach at least four messages about Christmas at Christmas time? Right? So we treat Easter, maybe maybe we're trying to follow tree. We'll hit that, you know. And, and, but we, we don't treat the resurrection week as anything bigger than just a week. And what's our faith fully based upon? I mean, if he did not rise again victoriously over the death, hell, and the grave, where's our faith? We have a dead deity, so to speak, right? So why do we treat it just shortly, even in our circles? Is that a fair question to ask? Why don't we have an Easter or resurrection season that we spend more time on this? Encouraging our people in the faith of the resurrection. You say, well, brother, come on. I mean, that's what we celebrate every Sunday, right? That's what we celebrate at the Lord's No, we remember his death at the Lord's table. And how many, we went through that. How many have moved on and mentioned something about his resurrection after that Lord's table? Are we amiss? Just asking questions in reality, practical, right? So how many of you uh, have ever done a, like a, Easter or resurrection season where you do at least more than four me- uh, four messages or more. Thank you. How many of you have not and you're willing to confess it? You know, that's a hard one. A bunch of pastors, you know, brother, I don't like you asking these questions, you know. This is terrible, you know. This is almost convicting. Oh, don't worry. The Lord's been whacking me upside the head on this stuff too. 